I am Sangeeta Mal, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am the treasurer of Flow Mobile. Uh, a very warm welcome to the second session of Startup Caravan. Today's session, as we can see on the screen, is setting up your business in India legally. So I can say from my own story that as a former entrepreneur, I can still recall the decision-making matrices I constructed to choose the right sort of corporation for myself. I had to think of not just the business then, but what it would look like in the future and how my company would be perceived by potential investors. I had to pass through the legal ramifications of the various kinds of corporations before choosing one. In the process, I discovered that each business has its own unique requirements and drivers, and the kind of corporation one chose depended on the commercials of the business, the people creating the business, the size and scale of the business, and a host of other factors. The entrepreneurs in our midst today will appreciate how vital it is to one's business to make the right choice when setting up, because changing one's mind halfway through can be a long and tedious process. Fortunately, today we have with us two experts to guide us on this very subject. I have with us Shohidi Mandal. Hi, Shohidi. Shohini is an associate partner with Vertis's partner, uh, an upcoming and I should say very, very successful law firm. Shohini wears many hats, but foremost is her expertise in practice areas of commercial and corporate law. She also conducts workshops on prevention and awareness of sexual harassment in the workplace. Shohini is a member of ITEC. Information Technology Law Association and International Association of Tech Lawyers. We also have uh, joining Shohini today, Hardik Thakkar. And Hardik is a corporate commercial lawyer and a senior associate with Vertis's partners. His areas of practice and expertise include PE and BC transactions, M&A, joint ventures, business slash asset acquisition transactions, corporate structuring, alternative investment funds, corporate governance, and corporate secretarial advisory. So we have, uh, I'm really grateful that we have two such experts to take over the workshop today. Over to you, Hardik and Shoyri, all the best, and looking forward to this session. Thank you for your kind introduction, Sangeeta. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sangeeta. Shall we begin that? So just one thing yeah. that if anybody has any questions in between also while they are speaking, you can please feel free to write on the chat box and as and when uh, they will be answered. And in any case, in the end, we'll have a Q&A round. Yes, you all can start. Thank now. you, Archana. Thank you for that. Okay, so before we begin, happy Independence Day, everyone. And uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, like they say, the key to success is to start before you're ready. Because as you embark on an entrepreneurial journey, uh, you will have to wear many hats. There'll be many, many challenges on the way. Um, so, so before you begin, preparedness so that once you begin and embark on that journey, you can focus on building the business and building the core products and services rather than focusing on the legalese and the legal structure for the, the right legal structure for the business. Um, also, also entrepreneurial journey is a very, very challenging one. It's, it's, it's a very long-term commitment. It's not a sprint and it's a marathon. Um, so to be successful in the journey of entrepreneurship, we would say is, is to be very, very well prepared. So well begun is half done. Today, um, uh, during our discussion, uh, and what we are going to primarily focus on are two very crucial aspects of the, of the uh, setting up of business from a legally specific um, one is the founding team strategy and the second one is the right structure for a business vehicle. 
um, understanding the key basic nuances of both the founding team strategy as well as the legalities around the right business vehicle structure uh, can go a long way in the success of the business and also helps the entrepreneurs taking a very very informed decision at every step of the process so a very quick road map to today's discussion uh, the pointers that we are going to touch on or are uh, key considerations for the founding team um, from a strategy perspective aspects to think through before you set up um, of course business vehicles in india and a few uh, legalities or structures of sole proprietorship partnership firm llp companies um, another important aspect of protection of intellectual property rights uh, we are also on a few key elements for governance and good governance from a policy perspective and setting up perspective um what are the nuances and key elements for compliance so that you can can be diligent ready if you have to go for external fundraisers um also towards the end we will touch upon the various initiatives by the government of india for facilitating ease of doing business in india right so we're going to start with key considerations for the founding team as a strategy so what happens is that as as young entrepreneurs as uh, founders many a times you will come together as a team to work on something commercial or business oriented probably for the first time ever uh, you could be friends coming together you could be family members coming together and therefore it's very important to have that initial discussion at the very beginning as to you know what will be the um, combined aligned vision of the business right so uh, from the perspective of the problem that you're trying to solve how you're trying to solve it and most importantly how you are going to make money out of it and and it's very important for the core founding team to be very aligned on this vision that all of all of the founders are on the same page the first important discussion from a strategic perspective therefore that needs to happen is what is going to be the roles and responsibilities of each of the co-founders and this this has various implications across our various other facets and i'll come to that um from a roles and responsibilities perspective what you have to what you have to keep in mind is that what is each of your core strength area right so um uh, somebody has to be in charge of finances somebody has to be in charge of the core product the core technology somebody has to be in charge of marketing operations sales um as well as human resources right so having very clear cut designated roles defined between um and amongst the co-founders really go a long way in uh, building a successful and scalable business this also helps in determining various other facets of the um, organization or the business uh, the first and paramount of paramount importance of that is the is the distribution shareholding or the distribution of ownership amongst the co-founders now um there is no magic formula on how you will distribute the uh, ownership amongst various founders however there are two primary factors that drive that distribution discussion one is of course the the, uh, uh, the core business and the kind of sweat that each of you are going to put for the development of that business how intrinsically related that sweat is to the business the other of course is the monetary con contribution that each of you would be putting into the company and this these are the two factors that will primarily determine the distribution of the shareholding or the ownership between the various co-founders the other important aspect that you need to think through while uh, uh, the uh, uh, founding team strategy discussion is how the management will be run and how the decision making will happen in the organization so many a times uh, you know it's better to have a decision making power given to um, a person who is running a particular uh, division or a particular head of the um, organization so that you know the person who is running it also has the ability to make the decision with respect to that the other decision making pro process could be a very democratic decision making process where every important decision in the organization is deliberated at the at the board level or at the partnership level and then you go ahead and uh, um, decide on the core important aspects of the decision making
Vesting is again very intrinsically linked to the shareholding and the ownership stake. Now, the construct of vesting stems from the perspective of you know having to earn the ownership stake, having to earn the economic benefit of the ownership stake, and also to maintain skin in the game. Uh, what it means effectively is that although you have your shareholding with you, the right to exercise or enjoy the economic benefits related. Uh, shares or the or the profit sharing kind of uh, comes from a, a vesting structure. So as and when you go down the structure as per the vesting period is how you earn the right to those uh, the benefit of those shares. A few typical structures of vesting uh, would be um, um, uh, when, it, when it comes to a time-based vesting, it could be a three to four years vesting with an initial cliff of or lock-in of let's say one year. Um, there could be performance based vesting also or milestone based vesting where you link the uh, uh, the earning of the ownership to achievement of certain parameters, uh, certain milestones in the company. Um, there could also be constructs of some amount of upfront vesting. Um, at the at the beginning of the vesting schedule, if uh, if there has been contribution from the founders even before you set up, for example, many a times you would have started developing the technology much before you uh, think of going and setting up and or or incorporating a company for that matter, right? So from that perspective, uh, the vesting will be a function of these various factors. Uh, vesting could be monthly, quarterly, or annual. Uh, typically, the vesting if the vesting period is let's say three years or four years, uh, at the time of an exit, which happens within the if it happens within the vesting period or a merger or an acquisition that happens within the vesting period, then there is an acceleration of vesting that happens, which means that you your right to exercise the economic benefit uh, um, gets accelerated so that you know uh, you you get a good exit and you you still get the uh, economic benefit of all the shares or the all, or the entire ownership of the organization um another aspect that is um, very big, it's it's required and recommended to have an upfront discussion on is what happens when when um, um, unfortunately um, uh, that one of the founders has to go through something unfortunate like a death or a disability situation. Uh, none of us like to talk about it, but therefore it's very important to have these discussions right at the very beginning so that you don't have these uncomfortable discussions going forward. Uh, typically, at a, um, at a, uh, if there is a death or disability linked situation, the acceleration of vesting comes in there as well because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an acceleration of the economic benefit for the nominees or the legal heirs then. The other important aspect that uh, you have to uh, think through as the founding team as to how you are going to bring in more funds into the company, how how the how the capital call will happen in the company from a growth perspective. If it's internal, then uh, how are you internally amongst the founding team bring, going to bring in more capital? And if it's external, then uh, uh, you need to decide on whether it will be a borrowing structure or um, or it's going to be equity dilutions. Of course, um, when it when it comes to dilutions, the understanding should be very clear that every shareholder will dilute proportionately at an external fundraise. Separation terms is something which is again very closely linked to vesting. One of the purpose of vesting is that it it um, can be used as a deterrent structure in terms of separation. Because the idea is that as a founding team, you have codependencies, you have uh, interrelations, and if one of the founders were to leave, uh, that may have an impact on the entire business and the growth and scalability of the business. So from that perspective, you could have very clearly laid down terms on what happens if there is a termination or a resignation within the vesting period. Um, that typically we see two kinds of scenarios, and uh, it's 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 recommended to have uh, this talked out right at the very beginning. Um, uh, you would see cause and non-cause scenarios that can kind of come in. A cause scenario is primarily the bad case scenarios where you're trying to, you will try and create a deterrence so that those eventualities do not occur or even if there is an impact on the shareholding or the ownership because of that. So that, you know, it, it acts as a uh, stopping agent, if I may say so. Um, uh, cause events could be scenarios like hypothet hypothetically um, uh, a misconduct or a negligence. 
So cause are the typical bad case scenarios where you're trying to uh, delineate certain aspects which are uh, uh, identified as uh, scenarios when there will be a deterrence. How it works is that uh, if it is a bad case scenario and there is a termination because of that, typically both vested and unvested shares are taken away. So that creates the deterrence effect and uh, taken away to uh, either park it in, an, in a neutral employee welfare trust so that it can be used for uh, you know, incentivizing further employees in the company, um, or it, it, it can even be bought back by the company. So there are various structures that come by. The price point at which this typically happens is at the, at the uh, face value linked valuation or uh, the price that, that um, you, know, you guys would have paid to get the, uh, uh, to begin with. So there is, there is no economic benefit that comes from these shares. However, if it is any other reason other than cause, and uh, there is a termination or a resignation because of those reasons, which, are, which can be identified as good reasons, then in those scenarios, um, uh, typically the vested shares are not touched upon. So the leaving founder uh, may have the ability to either retain the, uh, the vested shares um, subject, of course, to certain uh, constructs of transfer restrictions in the organization, um, or, or even the other founders of the company can buy back the vested shares at the prevalent valuation at that point of time. Um, what happens to unvested is again, and all of these structures are just uh, you know, examples that I'm given. Nothing is uh, set in stone and it varies on a case-to-case -case basis, basis the discussions that the co-founding team has as a strategy to begin with. And uh, therefore you can decide at a good reason to either, uh, either with unvested share so that you can use it for you know, bringing someone else into the company, or you can even decide to you know, buy it back at a certain discount valuation. These are different structures that can be evaluated. And the reason we are talking about all these aspects of vesting, capital calls, separation terms, etc., is to have these very clearly laid down as an understanding in, in something like a founder's agreement, which you can get into at any point of time, um, the earlier the better. You can do it before setting up or immediately after setting up as well. Um, how it helps primarily is to have those discussions and having those understandings laid down so that, you know, going forward, you don't have to come back and revisit these aspects again and again. Um, the founders agreement may also include uh, provisions on uh, transfer restrictions, like I said, um, a, a, a time period between which the shares cannot be uh, sold at all, uh, non compete non-solicitation, intellectual property protection, etc. We can move on to the next slide. Yes. So after understanding the nuances of uh, vesting, these are certain key aspects uh, which before uh, we decide and before we move on to deciding which will be the most appropriate business vehicle, uh, these are the certain aspects which we have to be very, very careful and take into consideration while uh, deciding the appropriate business vehicle for our business nature of business activity, the business plan. Business plan will have all the nuances of uh, revenues, expenses, future cash flows. So play a critical role in terms of deciding uh, the nature of business vehicle. What will be the funding requirements for our business? Immediate, long-term, short-term, the stages, that will be a factor in scalability of our operations, uh, what are our plan in terms of scaling the operations? How do we want to do it? Markets and geographies. What are the markets which we are targeting? Uh, are we targeting a business to business market? Are we trying to uh, target business to consumer? Uh, are we trying to uh, use online platforms uh, as a marketplace? Uh, what will be the geographies in which we will be uh, in? Will it be local, state, state, international? What shall be the ownership and management structure which we are focusing on? Uh, how many number of co-founders uh, do we have? What plan do we have with regards to their ownership structure? The management. What is the longevity of our business idea? Is it uh, currently focused on the immediate need uh, which is there, which, which the opportunity has come and the market is looking? Or it has 
sustainable uh, development plan in place what are the applicable laws which are governing our business what are the applicable laws which will govern the business vehicle what is our contingency plan contingency plan would also include our plan b it would also include uh, scenarios when we want to quickly change the line of business given the current times we have seen uh, being very very flexible in changing your business plan adopting to the current market needs and scenarios very very critical for us to consider as well at the very inception because this will play a critical role when we decide uh, a business vehicle transferability of ownership again uh, this this is again from a perspective when we are looking at a situation for an acquisition for an hire so how do we transfer the ownership of our business vehicle so all these are some of the critical aspects which we'll have to think through while we then move on to the next uh, course is looking at the business vehicles these are the top most preferred business vehicles in india which we have seen so this is what we'll be talking today in today's presentation a sole proprietorship a partnership firm limited liability partnership and a company all those aspects which we uh, spoke including we will try and cover the aspects in this presentation where we'll try and give you a uh, brief nuances of each and every business vehicle and then have a bird's eye view of how we come to the decision making process right so first we are going to talk about sole proprietorship uh, this is this is a form of a business vehicle where a single individual is in the driver's seat and completely controlling the entire business organization um it it is not um, there is no separate law or specific law governing this uh, business structure and this is not a separate legal entity by itself it is completely driven by the uh, single individual who is driving this so all profits and all losses and all liabilities kind of go back to the sole proprietor there is no minimum capital investment required um there is no formal procedure for setting up per se um all you have to do is open a bank account and have your normal business registrations of a permanent account number or a trade account number and gst of course becomes applicable as and when you cross the uh, designated thresholds of uh, on the, the gst applicability um this structure by itself is uh, something which you may evaluate if you're if you're just uh, wanting to fly solo and test waters um this is a good option uh, for those kind of business um, opportunities um however please keep in mind that this is not a like i said it's not a separate legal entity so it's it it completely exposes the sole proprietor to the entire gamut of liabilities as well as profits and losses next we are going to talk about partnership firm uh, this is a very old business structure by itself and some of you will probably be aware of it already a partnership firm is uh, governed by the partnership act 1932 and the rules there under what means is uh, individuals or uh, entities coming together to form a structure it's it's defined as the relation between persons who have agreed to share the property profits of a business carried on by all or any of them acting for all this is primarily governed by a chartered document or partnership deed which is a document that all partners get into and execute um, and document typically has provisions pertaining to what is going to be the business of the partnership what is the purpose of forming the partnership uh, what is the object of the partnership who is going to contribute what amount of uh, money in the partnership uh, when a distribution happens or a profit sharing happens how the contribution is going to be uh, uh, then then divided between the different partners what is going to be the ratio of profit sharing between the different partners how the profit sharing uh, amount will be distributed amongst the different partners um and of course needless to say the management structure of the partnership firm what is going to be the decision making layer of the partnership firm who are going to decide um these are the various aspects that kind of get into the document the, which is the partnership deed and that is the document that govern all 
the relationships between the partners going forward. Um, this again is not considered as a separate legal entity. Um, so the liability of the partners are not limited. The, any liability on the partnership firm can flow back to the individual partners to the fullest extent. And that's one of the risks associated with the structure of a partnership firm. Minimum number of partners can be two and maximum can be 50. Uh, it is not mandatory to register a partnership firm with the registrar of firms, but there are certain additional benefits that um, a registered for partnership firm has, which an unregistered partnership firm does not have. For example, a partnership firm which is not registered cannot file a suit against a third party. The partners cannot file suits inter each other and vice versa. Uh, partners cannot file a suit for enforcement of their rights under the partnership deed unless the partnership deed is registered with the registrar of firms. So if you're forming a partnership firm, it's always recommended to have the partnership deed registered with the registrar of firms. Yes. After looking at uh, sole proprietorship and partnership, we have limited liability partnership. Uh, this is one of the latest business uh, vehicle entrant in India where in year 2008, Liability Partnership Act was enacted specifically for uh, It is a separate, uh, when we talk about it being a body corporate, it is a separate legal entity considered uh, separate from the partners. So LLP in itself is considered as a legal entity. The claims of or the liabilities of the partners here are limited. It is not to an extent uh, unlimited as in a uh, partnership. So it's a mix of, we can say uh, partnership where the ownership and the management structure is very similar to partnership. Whereas uh, having a separate body corporate and having a separate legal status uh, allows the company, uh, allows the LLP to have a distinct entity in itself. The chartered document here will be a limited liability partnership deed, very similar to partnership deed. It will contain the main objects, the purpose of the business, the capital contribution, the profit sharing ratio, modalities for profit sharing ratios, the governance rights, which are their respective roles of the partners. Uh, here there is a distinction uh, under the LLP Act with regards to a partner and a designated partner. Designated partner is the one who is responsible for managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the company and will be responsible for the compliances. Registration of LLP is mandatory. So uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, through registrar of companies uh, monitor the workings of the LLP. So necessary forms are to be filed prior to commencement uh, and, and to start operations under a limited liability partnership. So there are certain incorporation forms which are required to be online uh, uploaded on the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website. Uh, digital signature certificate, having a designated partner identification number is one of the criteria uh, for uh, having uh, to proceed with incorporation. Uh, minimum uh, is to have two designated partners. There has to be at least one designated partner who is resident here. Uh, even body corporates and when we talk about body corporates that also includes a company. Uh, also uh, one LLP can be a designated partner in another LLP. A company can be a designated partner or a partner in LLP. So those are certain finer nuances which give LLP a much required edge over a traditional partnership which we had. There is no minimum contribution requirement here. Contribution can be in form of cash, capital. Uh, it can be in form of the property. It can be in form of services which you are going to render to an LLP. So both tangible as well as tangible can be part of capital contribution towards the LLP. And that capital contribution will then decide and have a factor of the profit sharing. Uh, LLPs are also eligible to uh, receive foreign direct investment, uh, which when uh, we do a bird's eye comparative, we'll see uh, that is not possible uh, in sole proprietorship and uh, partnership. But 
with certain uh, restrictions which are uh, made available uh, foreign direct investment are permissible in limited liabilities next is is one of the most uh, maybe well known and and a form where companies is one of the business vehicle uh, they are governed under the companies act 2013 this is again the latest uh, legislation which came uh, earlier it was a 1956 act which was governing companies now looking at the market scenarios uh, there was a new act which was amended so it's a holistic legislation in itself where it deals with all facets when we talk about a company it talks about incorporation of the company it talks about management and affairs it talks about mergers and amalgamation talks about demergers takeover cases of operations mismanagement winding up everything so it's a holistic legislation and code in itself company is a body yes it is a separate entity legal entity in itself what helps that is again limiting the liability company has a very important concept where the delineation between ownership and management when we talk about ownership the shareholders are the owners of the company and the management responsibility is there with the board of directors of the company the liability of the company in itself is limited only to an extent of assets and properties of the uh, company or uh, liability of the share can are limited only to an extent if there is an unpaid amount towards the shares which they hold uh, when we talk about uh, uh, companies uh, three form of most tip, uh, uh, typical companies would be a private limited company public limited company and one person company a uh, private limited company uh, has a basic requirement of having these two shareholders maximum allowed shareholders are 200 uh, there's a restriction on transferability of the shares of a private limited company when we talk about restrictions the shares are not freely transferable there are certain restrictions which are required to be undertaken where uh, only pursuant to those approvals necessary approvals by the board is when uh, the shares can be transferred uh, there is a restriction on a private limited company to raise funds you cannot raise funds uh, from public and invite public at large uh, initial public offerings accessing capital markets is something restrictive for a private limited company minimum number of directors required for a private limited company are to maximum we can have 15 again the requirement here is that there is a requirement to have at least one director who is resident in india so a resident director requirement uh, when we talk about the corporate governance and uh, statutory compliances they are fairly fairly uh, less when we talk about private limited company a uh, public limited company is again uh, one of one of the ways uh, which is again minimum requirement is seven shareholders there's no maximum cap you can have as many number of shareholders as you want there's no restriction on transferability of shares we can access capital in public markets initial public offerings can happen to a public limited companies minimum there is a requirement to have three directors maximum 15 again with a requirement to have uh, one resident director here the corporate governance and uh, diligence based or or uh, compliance based uh, requirements are fairly high in a public limited company one person company was again something which was introduced in companies act 2013 itself uh, if we see the concept of one person company it is very similar very similar to a sole proprietorship where only one person is a shareholder a uh, minimum director is one maximum again you can have 15 directors so again going back to a concept where there's a delineation in a company between ownership and management so owner has to be one uh, that is one minimum director uh, it also has certain mandatory conversion requirements so it is mandatory to convert one person company into a public company or a private company once the share capital which is the total amount of shares which you are going to issue or which you are going to issue if it exceeds 50 lakh rupees or 
when the average annual turnover for preceding three financial year exceeds the sum of rupees two crores, that's where when you have to mandatorily convert a one person company into a public company or a private company. This is also these restrictions are also uh, key reasons where one person companies have not been uh, incorporated as much as uh, private limited companies and uh, public limited companies. The chartered documents for uh, a company becomes memorandum of association. Uh, memorandum of association mainly covers the main objects of the business. Uh, it also covers ancillary and other objects which the company will uh, carry out or proposes to carry out. It also considers the authorized share capital of the company, uh, which the company will be authorized to issue from time to time. Uh, Association, these are the management and governance charter. It will lay out uh, how the company will carry out its operations, what will be the roles and responsibilities of directors, who will be the directors, whether there are any shareholders who have specific rights with regards to nominating directors, whether do they have certain management rights. So those are the nuances which typically get captured in the articles of association. When we talk about share capital, there are predominantly two types of share capital. One is equity share capital and preference share capital. Equity share is like a common share, a common stock where uh, they are the all weather shareholders of the company, irrespective profits, losses. Uh, equity shares hold the highest amount of risk. Uh, preference share capital is a rank above equity shares where they have certain preferential rights with regards to receipt of dividend, because one of the modalities for uh, giving out uh, the value to the shareholder is distribution of dividend. So from that perspective, preference shares get a higher preference when you have to uh, give dividends. When the company is winding up, obviously after meeting all the statutory dues, uh, payments to the creditors, payment to secured creditors, government authorities, employees, when there is a balanced sum which is available, uh, the preference shareholders get the first preference out of the balance and then it the equity shares. So that is the distinction uh, from a macro perspective between an equity share and a preference shares. Uh, company also allows to have these hybrid instruments amongst uh, equity shares and preference shares where equity shares can have differential voting rights. Uh, equity shares uh, can have differential uh, 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 rights in terms of dividends. Preference shares can be again be hybrid where they are mandatorily converted into equity shares at a particular point. They can be redeemed where the company can redeem and repay that amount uh, which was paid uh, uh, for preference shares. Uh, again, uh, there are other instruments which are predominantly debt instruments, uh, debentures, where they, uh, for all practical purposes, they qualify as a debt which is taken by a company. So there again, debentures can be issued, uh, non-convertible debentures, they cannot be converted into equity shares, uh, they'll have to be repaid by the company. There are redeemable debentures where company may uh, redeem or at a later point in time even convert into equity shares. So those are typically the nature of instruments which can be given uh, to the shareholders who then become uh, owners of the company uh, respective to the shares, respective to the instrument which they are holding. Uh, again, it is mandatory to register a company. Uh, incorporation of a company again is governed by Ministry of Corporate Affairs exercise through registrar of companies. Uh, now, very recently, uh, there is a single window form which has been notified by the Ministry of Corporate Affairs for the purposes of incorporation. Uh, with this incorporation, the name availability application, obtaining of director's identification number, every director of the company is required to have this unique director identification number, obtaining basic tax and other registrations like PAN, TAN, GST, ESIC, uh, EPFO. There is a single form now introduced by the ministry 
where these forms can be filed and registration can be availed. Uh, the registration time now uh, has fairly reduced earlier it to at least take around three to four weeks for incorporation because there were multiple forms that has been reduced now. If everything, all the documents filed are in order, then from that perspective, uh, the incorporation can happen even within a week. Earlier in the Companies Act 2013, there was a minimum requirement for having capital for a private company, for a public company that again, uh, from a perspective of ease of doing business, that requirement to have minimum capital has been done away with. The companies can uh, receive and are eligible to receive even foreign direct investment. Uh, depending upon the sector, the foreign direct investment policy of uh, India, they bifurcate and they give uh, various uh, we can say restrictions, various modalities with regards to investment in India. But yes, company again becomes one of the most favored route when we talk about foreign direct investment in India. Now that we have discussed each of the uh, four structures uh, that we talked about, um, in, in, in terms of the nitty gritties of those particular structures. Uh, what we wanted to do is also do a quick comparative analysis of these four structures based on certain parameters and aspects so that it's, it's easier for you to understand uh, um, from which perspective a structure may be preferred. So um, as you can see, we have, we have done the comparison between sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLPs, and private limited companies. From a registration perspective, of course, sole proprietorship, it is not required to be registered. In case of partnership firm, it's optional. Um, in case of LLP and private limited company, of course, it's mandatory registration requirement as per law. In terms of the legal state, each of these entities, which also determines the kind of liability and ownership, uh, sole proprietorship and partnership firms are not separate entities, which means there is a liability, liability flowback to the sole proprietor or the partners. Um, in case of limited liability partnership and private limited company, these are legal status, these are entities which have separate legal existence of their own. They are considered to be separate legal entities and the liabilities of the limited of the partners of an LLP or the shareholders of a private limited company are also limited. So uh, if there is a liability, uh, uh, then it, it is limited to the LLP and the private limited company and the liability of the shareholders or the uh, partners are limited to their shareholding or ownership in the LLP it does not flow back into their individual capacities. From a management or responsibility perspective, needless to say, in case of a sole proprietorship, it, everything is on the sole proprietor. It's entirely on the sole proprietor. In a partnership form, it is again on the partners, but inter se the founders, you uh, inter se the partners, uh, the, uh, you can decide uh, who will be responsible for what, whether the decision making will be structured through certain partners. Uh, there are constructs under the Partnership Act also, which need to be complied with. Uh, similarly, in LLP, uh, the, the decision making and the management responsibility primarily lies with the designated partners. As Hardik mentioned, there has to be a minimum of two designated partners and they are considered to be the, uh, uh, to be the promoter like in an LLP. Uh, there could be other partners who will be limited partners. Um, however, uh, the roles and responsibilities that the LLP Act also specifies in terms of a designated partner is, is uh, much more than the limited partners. The designated partners will be in charge to day operations and and functions of the company and running uh, of the LLP and running the business of the LLP. In case of a private limited company, as you may be aware, this is this being the most common business vehicle, uh, the, the decision making is primarily driven through a board of directors structure and, and the board of directors kind of are uh, responsible for um, all the management related decision making uh, and the day to day running and the executive directors in the board of directors primarily are responsible for um, uh, the operations and management of the affairs of the company. From a compliance perspective, um, sole proprietorship, of course, has zero or 
very limited uh, compliance. There are no constructs of uh, monthly or quarterly or annual compliance in a sole proprietorship. It's only the tax compliance which into picture, which is applicable for uh, you as an individual also. Uh, in a partnership firm, it's it's less compliance, but uh, some amount of compliance is also required in terms of your um, accounts keeping, um, uh, audits, etc. In an LLP, it is still limited to uh, it, it is still limited compliance, but in a private limited company. I mean, that's the most uh, compliance heavy structure where uh, you will have to have uh, quarterly board meetings, you will have to have, uh, uh, you will have to comply with the provisions of the Companies Act in terms of your quarterly and uh, uh, annual, annual uh, uh, filings and uh, keeping up maintenance of statutory registers and the compliance is a little heavier um, uh, on, the, on the private limited company uh, structure. Yes. After that, we decide uh, the factors with regards to the business, business idea, the longevity of the business. If it's an extreme short term uh, is what our focus is. It's a risk free idea. It is it is predominantly uh, personal centric driven, then sole proprietor is an option. Uh, even if it's a short term business idea, but it involves multiple partners, you have multiple partners involved then partnership becomes uh, an option available. Uh, from short term to a medium term perspective, uh, if we want to ring fence the liability of the partners and ensure uh, the constructs of limitations of liabilities of the corporation, which is an LLP here and the partners is met, then limited liability incorporation of limited liability partnership becomes the most viable option. And of course, as you know, looking at the compliance requirement, looking at, at the cost of even maintaining and managing a company, uh, the business idea being a medium to long term uh, involving multi parties, few parties when you have uh, other investors, third party, when the stakeholder uh, ambit is wide is when we bring in uh, private limited companies. From a fundraise perspective, uh, very, very limited options are available for sole proprietorship. Typically, it will be uh, raising debt, getting loan. Uh, with a partnership, the same, same goes, very limited uh, fund options which are available. Uh, debt or partner's contribution in the partnership. Uh, LLP, again, uh, traditional uh, debt models, partners contribution uh, with, with distinction and having a separate legal status. It also allows joint venture or a strategic uh, investment to happen in LLP. If it's only limited, again, limited within that two partners or a strategic partner is closely held, then LLP is one of the options. Uh, with companies, again, we have various, various options. Traditional uh, debt options are always available. But uh, as we spoke about different hybrid instruments, which a company can issue, uh, debt instruments like debentures, convertible notes, warrants, uh, all, all, all kind of structures can be uh, addressed with these kind of uh, uh, issuance these kind of modes which are available. So from that perspective, as well as financial investment becomes the most preferred route when we have a private limited company. When we talk about investment in foreign direct investment, uh, it's not possible. It's not preferred in sole proprietorship, not preferred in partnership. Uh, again, when we spoke strategic investment limited within joint ventures, LLP can be, again, it's not the most preferred, but it's moderately preferred. And when it comes to investment, including foreign direct investment, uh, private limited becomes the most preferred option uh, simply because a uh, lot of governance through Companies Act, foreign direct investment policies, uh, those are available. So from that perspective, uh, private limited company becomes the most preferred route there. All right. Now that we have 
touched upon the founding team strategy and the popular business vehicles the other important aspect for setting up that we want to discuss today is the protection of intellectual property rights um this is important uh, for for various reasons primarily to begin uh, with the most important reason for you to know about ip is because as a business when you have an idea or or you're trying to solve a problem through technology or innovation right uh, what you need to be most aware of is how to protect your um, intellectual property uh, because that is something that will drive up the value of your business from an external perspective also a eh? and secondly it gives you an exclusive right with respect to the uh, uh, the intellectual property that you have so that uh, you know going forward nobody else can copy it or reproduce it or or uh, misuse it in any way so we are going to talk about a few forms of um, intellectual property protection in india uh, first is copyright copy is a natural right there is no uh, registration which is mandatorily required for a copyright protection so for example and it is if it is available for any idea which is expressed in any literary dramatic musical or artistic form which means that if 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 um, you have an idea and it is reproduced in a form of expression in any of these four manners then it becomes naturally copyrighted you don't have to separately apply for copyright protection um it gives you a right exclusive right to reproduce it translate it adapt it or sell the protected work and it's also available on computer program or software codes um the advantage the copyright comes into uh, uh, play and becomes relevant for uh, to give you an example for very various content related uh, business models um, in education technology the way you would do your course modules etc uh, is something that becomes copyrightable then um, the next aspect of intellectual property protection would be trademark this again is a protection of the way you're uh, doing your branding designing logo uh, the mark that you're using um, either in form of you know your unique words or designs that you have uh, the moment you have so trademark is not a natural protection um, you have to register for trademark protection and it's it's not a very complicated process it can be done online it's a simple process um what happens with the trademark registration is that um it gives you an exclusive right as an owner to uh, you know use that particular word mark or design or logo for the purpose of your business only so in a sense it gives you an edge over your competitor over a particular uh, brand or logo um it's a, it's a sign that 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 gets identified with so that's that's one of the most important and basic aspects of uh, intellectual property protection the other form of intellectual property protection which which is a little more complicated than copyright or trademark would be patents um the the threshold for protection is and and the threshold for getting registration for patents is a little higher because of the um uh, because of the nature of the uh, intellectual property and the kind of rights it gives to you it kind of gives you a monopoly over the invention that you are patenting so for example um if and there are there are various criteria uh, which you have to comply with before you go for a patent registration these are these are primarily given under the definition of invention in the patents act 1970 so uh, the the some of the basic criteria that you have to meet before you go for a patent application is that it has to be a completely novel product or process um uh, when i say product or process to give you a few example um a new product uh, could could you could apply for a, a patent application for a new product that you have developed or a process which is unique and new in a in a previously uh, prevalent practice right so for example uh, from a pharmaceutical perspective if you are if you are bringing in a new process uh, for building uh, for developing a particular drug you can you can apply for a patent application for that process uh, as well however other two criteria uh, will also have to be complied with which is that it should it should be inventive it should be novel and it should have utility or industrial application so it should be solving a problem and it cannot be something which has no uh, commercial use per se so therefore uh, given the higher threshold the uh, form of protection is uh, the the uh, the 
um, ability to get a patent protection is also um, um, higher. However, these are the three primary intellectual property protection that you have. There are other uh, intellectual property protections in terms of designs. Um, uh, we do not have any legislation in India per se, which protects trade secrets, but you can have uh, contractual protection uh, to protect your trade secrets. For example, if you're doing something which is very unique to your business, uh, whenever you disclose that to, to a third party, you should always have non-disclosure agreements so that contractually uh, you're protecting your secret. Will, We'll now um, quickly run through a few key elements for having a good governance structure after you have, after you have set up. And uh, these, these go a long way in having certain practices and policies in place in the organization, which you can then further go and develop upon as you grow bigger and scale to larger proportions. Uh, to give you a few, few examples, a good governance practice would be to have a very uh, well uh, uh, set out and well delineated decision making structure in the organization where, you know, clearly laid down delegation of responsibility, delegation of authorization rules are there. Um, as risk identification and mitigation practices, you will have to be uh, very cognizant about the kind of risk that comes with the particular business that you have, right? So from a, from a, from a business perspective, if your business is very uh, heavily dependent upon recovery mechanisms, you need to have policies in place which will ensure that your recovery happens in a, in a uh, timely manner so that, you know, your dependencies on other aspects, the correlation of the recovery uh, is taken care of. Um, of course, you can have contractual processes and you should have contractual processes in place for risk identification and mitigation. You should have written understandings and terms and conditions with each of your vendors, each of your customers, so that you know there is no liability um, uh, that comes to you, or you know you're you're, you're not agreeing, you're not going into grey waters without knowing uh, what what you're getting into. From a business perspective, again, if, if the business is very data heavy, then you need to have a data protection policy in place because that also is one of the key aspects of risk identification and mitigation. Um, just to give a small example, if your business is customer facing, you'll have to have grievance redressal mechanism or a refund policy, for example, to take care of risks and uh, uh, associated with that. You need to have very well-defined charter documents, which we have already discussed in detail in the previous slides, um, and that will depend clearly upon the structure that you choose as your business vehicle. Uh, the management roles have to be very clearly uh, laid down and primarily between founders or partners. You have to have very clearly laid down roles and responsibilities. Uh, the applicable laws identification uh, becomes critical and there are certain registrations that you have to begin with um, as you set up. Uh, some of these would be shops and establishments registration. When you cr cross certain employee thresholds, your uh, provident fund registration, employee stock, uh, employees uh, state insurance registrations will come in. Uh, from a graduate perspective, although it becomes applicable after, after a period of five years, you need to uh, uh, submit a form uh, in a particular form and manner uh, to the to the authorities um, the moment you have established and set up office so those are the aspects that you need to comply with so that you're you're compliant and diligence ready if there is an external fundraise happening uh, in, uh, these are all from external perspectives from an internal perspective also you need to have certain policies in place um, depending on how you're growing and how you're scaling up um, it's very, some of the important internal policies would be to have a human resources policy, a code of conduct of how uh, your employees should behave, dress code for your employees, for example, um, grievance redressal mechanism for your employees, and and uh, something that requires a separate discussion by itself is a is a is a policy against sexual harassment and frequent training in in those aspects to the employees um, as well as any uh, internal um, uh, consultants or service providers in the organization. Right. So after looking at the governance, uh, the key element comes into the compliance. Uh, compliance with business specific permits. So uh, these are the three broad buckets under which we uh, 
uh, talk about compliances, compliance with business specific permits and consents, uh, Drugs and Cosmetic Act, if we are manufacturing a particular uh, product which falls under that category, uh, if a specific uh, manufacturing uh, unit is to be placed, then we talk about environmental clearance. If we are into construction, the necessary permits and consents for construction. If we are creating an app or, or, or a platform, then the applicable data privacy law as per the Information Technology Act they become very critical. Uh, after we specific permits and consents, we move to the uh, compliance which are there from applicable central and state legislations, uh, Companies Act 2013, or depending upon which uh, regulation or which way you choose, the applicable regulations will change. So Companies Act, the various labor legislations, uh, they, depending from center to state, they change. So that is one bucket where we have to be extremely careful uh, from a compliance perspective. And then the third is the local registrations for setting up a business entity. So Shop and Establishment Act, e-waste management rules, which are specific to each and every locality and state. So these are the top uh, three buckets under which we put compliance and we have to focus uh, because it's critical that uh, compliance is kept foremost at the beginning itself. Uh, as we say, opportunities and, and you know, uh, uh, opportunities come in greatest of adversities. So uh, looking at the current scenarios, uh, uh, we would also like to touch upon certain initiatives which are taken by the government of India uh, for uh, promoting business, ease of doing business. Uh, so under the ease of doing business head, uh, these are the top uh, actionables being taken by the government of India. Uh, reduction in time of setting up, as we said, uh, now there's a single window form available for a company, which is reduced substantially the time for incorporation of a company. That single form has various applications, can be done, PAN, TAN, GST, uh, ESIC, EPFO. Uh, the Central Board of Excise and Custom has also implemented a single window uh, project where it facilitates the import, importers and exporters where they can lodge the custom clearance document at a single point in time. Uh, the sub-registrar office where a lot of documents which are mandated to be registered, uh, they have started moving uh, online. Integration in terms of the land data records have been done. Uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code is the legislation which is brought uh, where typically uh, the only remedy prior to that was winding up a particular company. Okay. But before winding up, uh, there is a process uh, where there will be a resolution mechanism which will happen and pursuant to that only when that resolution mechanism fails is when the company will move towards insolvency. So insolvency and bankruptcy code has definitely uh, played a pivotal role in terms of sustenance of uh, business. Uh, change in the latest taxation regime, uh, reduction in the corporate tax rate, uh, abolition of dividend distribution tax. Uh, those are certain uh, key initiatives undertaken by the government of India from an ease of doing business perspective. And as on October 2019, India is ranked uh, 63rd uh, on the World Bank's ease of uh, doing business. We'll briefly refer to the um, uh, Startup India Action Plan, which has been launched quite some time back in order to boost the startup ecosystem specifically and to and to um, drive sustainable economic growth in the startup ecosystem. Um, just to just to uh, give a brief pointer of who can be recognized as a startup, there are primarily three criteria. It has to be a private limited company or an LLP. 
proprietorship firm. So going back to the business structures, a sole proprietorship cannot be recognized as a startup. Um, it, uh, you cannot be more than 10 years old. Uh, the turnover in any financial um, year cannot have exceeded uh, 100 crores. And there has to be, the entity has to be working towards some sort of an innovation or development that, that leads to uh, a scalable business and uh, creates employment generation or wealth creation opportunities. The, uh, one of the important things is that if it is a split up or a reconstructed entity or a reorganized entity, then the startup um, uh, recognition does not um, uh, become available. So this is slightly important because, uh, you know, many a times you may start up as you may set up as a partnership firm or um, an LLP, but later on from a fundraising requirement perspective, you may have to uh, reorganize yourself as a company. Uh, if you do that, there are def different structures of doing that but if you do that then uh, you lose out on uh, you know applying for a startup recognition uh, under the startup india action plan uh, some of the benefits of the startup india action plan would be that uh, there is an income tax exemption for three years there are fast tracking of various uh, patent applications rebates available and various startup linked benefits that come as you as you get recognized as a startup during the COVID pandemic time, uh, if we see the initiatives by government of India from a perspective of business, there's a change in the definition of micro, small and medium enterprise. There is a specific legislation dealing with micro, small and medium enterprises, uh, pursuant to which there are various benefits which are available to MSMEs. Uh, there are various government schemes, uh, including financial schemes by the RBI, through various non-banking financial institutions where lending facilities have been given to MSMEs. So the definition of MSMEs, uh, me uh, medium, small and micro enterprises, the thresholds uh, under the MSME Act, there were various thresholds which were uh, prescribed from a perspective of the investment and also on the turnovers. So we have seen substantial increase in, in the definition uh, and the criteria for the turnovers and, and uh, investment in plant and machinery or equipment, uh, which uh, the government of India has done. So it has widened the ambit of MSMEs and uh, it has uh, opened uh, MSMEs uh, who were not earlier, maybe they were slightly higher, but still at, at a startup stage, but now still considered as MSMEs are and are getting certain benefits there has been a suspension of any kind of insolvency or bankruptcy related proceedings under IBC for default in payments for a period of one year. This is again was an idea to protect small and medium enterprises not to be subjected to any kind of claims under insolvency and bankruptcy code. Uh, various uh, offenses or non-compliances under the Companies Act they have been decriminalized. There were certain aspects of criminal action against the board of directors, uh, <clears throat> criminalized to ensure that uh, the companies go ahead and they, they uh, incorporate and small and minor uh, non-compliances are not treated as, as criminal offenses. Allocation of fresh funds have happened through RBI to MSMEs. Uh, Startup assistance scheme by SIDBI. SIDBI by itself uh, is, is, is a uh, government arm which predominantly uh, invests in capital as a share capital. It invests as a share in the company. Uh, but uh, considering the COVID-19 pandemic times, they have changed and moved and this COVID-19 startup assistance scheme is there, which gives a working capital facility of up to two crores to various startups. Again, as Shoini mentioned, you have to be registered startup for availing these schemes. But these are some of the benefits which are made available to startup in this given time. Uh, various initiatives, local for vocal, Atmanirbhat Bharat. Uh, very recently, the transparent taxation platform for faceless assessment, appeals, and uh, taxpayer charters. So these are some of the initiatives uh, which have uh, been undertaken in recent times. Uh, government of India for uh, business and business vehicles specific. 
think with, with that we come to an end of our presentation and we can take uh, if there are any specific questions which you would ask us, if you would want to ask us. I think one of you have a question on what solicitation means. Um, I, I've uh, mentioned it, but I'll also explain a little bit. Solid solicitation is used primarily in the context of, you know, um, uh, let's say an employee or a founder going away from from an organization and joining another organization. Uh, you would want to put restrictions in the employment agreement or the founders agreement in terms of not enabling a leaving founder or leaving to take away your employees or your customers, for example, and that is what uh, primarily solicitation means. Right. One if of you also, questions, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you can do that as well. If you want to raise your hand, please feel free to do that. And also, I think, Sohini, is there any other question in the chat which you can see? Yes. Uh, one of you had asked a question on registrations. I think they have covered various registrations in bits and pieces um, in terms of, you know, shops and establishment, provident fund, employee state insurance, um, uh, uh, submitting a form in case of gratuity, how, PAN, TAN, etc. However, the specific business related registrations will be dependent upon the kind of business that you're getting into. For example, if you're running a food business, you have to have a registration or license under the uh, FS which is the governing body for uh, those kind of businesses. So depending on the business, there could be specific business related registrations as well, for which you need to have a uh, thorough check and understanding on all the applicable registrations required. Whole process of trademark. Uh, like I said, it's an online process. You have to begin by uh, doing an online search of the marks available and uh, uh, if not, then you have to pay a fee and apply for the uh, trademark registration. There's a process then, uh, then that sets going in terms of uh, that the application being evaluated by the trademark registry. Uh, there is an opportunity for anyone to object to that within a given time frame. If there is no objection, then the trademark registry evaluates it and passes it. If there is objection, then there are other proceedings that uh, then come by. I think uh, there's a question on what is debentures. Uh, debentures, again, is an instrument. It evidences a debt uh, undertaken by a company. So when debt or uh, it, it is not termed as loan, but when that particular amount is uh, invested by a particular investor as a debt to a company, which means it is repayable at a particular point in time with a particular coupon rate of interest, so the certificate or the instrument which company issues to that particular investor is called debentures. There are various forms of debentures, uh, uh, convertible debentures where that initial till the time that particular debt is converted, uh, it is considered as debt post which it can be converted into equity shares. So that's a convertible debenture. Uh, it can be a non-convertible debenture where after a point in time, uh, there is a specific requirement to repay that particular debenture along with interest. So uh, there are various, uh, there's a specific provision under the Companies Act dealing categorically with issuance of debentures and types of debentures. So from a perspective, it's an instrument which a company issues on account of uh, debt. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, I should. Yeah, uh, so I had a question. Uh, I don't know if it is the right question for this session, but uh, uh, so uh, let's say I'm being offered some sweat equity uh, from a startup. So uh, it's an LLP. And uh, so is there something specific I should keep in mind uh, while accepting it, the equity? So you did mention it's a limited liability partnership yeah, and yeah. offering you a sweat equity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, limited liability partnership does not have a construct of or instruments uh, which can be issued as shares. Uh, 
uh, ultimately it will be in terms of a partnership contribution uh, again limited liability partnership act uh, as as we saw in the slide uh, giving a service to an llp can be considered a form of capital contribution uh, however it is very very important uh, in in this specific case to ensure that how that particular service is valued uh, and there'll be a lot of documentation in terms of uh, limited liability partnership deed and also a document inter se which will be drawn up between the designated partners the limited liability partnership and you to give you that construct of being a partner because the concept of sweat equity per se the holding of an instrument is not something which is which is uh, uh, easily or it's uh, tailor made uh, when it comes to llp it is very very uh, tailor made and specific because an instrument can be granted under companies act and and as a company but not under llp so there's there's a slight uh, variation and it will require a lot of structuring to uh, give effect to this particular uh, uh, you know requirement all right there's one question on any tips or tricks for an organization to perform better um Uh, a few aspects that we mentioned are for uh, you know uh, enabling the uh, founders or the entrepreneurs to set it up right so that going forward you don't have to face these challenges um, like we mentioned it's very important to have internal policies in place internal practices in place which will help the organization to perform better uh, by ensuring that you have data protection me measures for example you have policies to um, uh, to delineate how employees should behave in the organization um how how misconduct will be treated in an organization for example and all of these are like building blocks which ultimately help in forming the uh, the the beautiful journey of the business i think we have time for one last question anyone i think there's a question uh, sohinian hardik on the chat Hello. which has come from gauri uh yeah actually i have a question okay so much uh, you can take it yeah yeah so basically i uh, so there's a person and uh, he he's already having like a business and he wants me to come in and uh, Uh, join him so uh for the, and he wants to like register as a company so the first thing is can a company be recognized as a startup like would can it be uh you know those government schemes can we avail them number one is this that i wanted to ask yes sama the answer is yes a company can be recognized as a startup okay but sama you have to register for it the company by virtue yeah. of being set up will not become a startup there are certain formalities mm. that have to be complied with you have to register as a startup only then can mm. you get those benefits which are available to a startup okay and uh, so basically like uh, and uh, uh, for the legal aspects like like should i get like get my own lawyer and uh, like how do i get that stuff done because i've never done it before so like do i get a lawyer where do i start because if i just follow him then he might do some you know uh, he might ex, uh, make some aspects or points in the contract which might backfire in the future like i want to make sure that everything is done right so like for those uh, stuff where do i start like should i get a lawyer or uh, are there like other agencies with help with this so someone were you there when we were talking about partners that's uh, yeah yeah that's that's actually i was just reading the chat and it is very similar to a question which gauri has uh, raised that as as a first time and aspiring entrepreneurs uh, there are a lot of legalities in terms of setting up uh, business in india so uh, what i think we'll have to uh, give uh, an idea of how critical uh, it is to have a right legal uh, team and a partner uh, at an inception stage itself uh because uh, that's how uh, you know to charter the company into a right direction 
and and maybe shoni i think we can we can, we can answer gauri and and uh, samar uh, question together holistically in terms of importance of having right legal team and uh, legal lawyers and partners at the inception stage itself Right. So, uh, Saman that and Gauri, I think one of the important criteria of determining and choosing who your uh, right legal partner would be to uh, you know um, understand the stage where you are at. Uh, many a times, you know, uh, legal teams do not do not really understand the challenges and facets of uh, uh, um, of the hardships and the challenges that come up in the startup sector. Uh, fortunately, where uh, we have a lot of expertise in terms of, you know, know, knowing the ecosystem very well, working with various partners in the ecosystem. And therefore, we understand the startup sector really well and the challenges that come by in a startup sector. For example, Samad, if you, are, if you, you mentioned getting into a contract with your um, with your partner and that is something which will be very important in determining and governing your ongoing relationship therefore we would recommend that you most certainly have that vetted by a legal team who understand the startup ecosystem because the lens for looking at these agreements will be very different from how you know legal teams would look at uh, matured companies and therefore the right legal team would be uh, who understand the uh, startup sector who understand the nuances of starting up and setting up if you may uh, just go on to our coordinate slides so that everyone can uh, uh, you know if anyone wants to reach out they can reach out as well yes you can take these details and feel free to get in touch with us if you have any specific questions because unfortunately we've run out of time okay thank you so much Sohini and Hardik, on behalf of Picky Flow and Vertis's partners, I would like to profusely thank both of you for this very insightful session. I think you both have beautifully explained to our participants the importance and nuances, you know, around several aspects which an entrepreneur goes through, and specifically when they are just starting out their business, because. Entrepreneurs are typically going to be very busy focusing on their business, building unique solutions that deliver customer delight. And that's what they should be doing, right? And but, yes. but at the same time, it is very important to have a you know sense of what is it that is important from a legal perspective and to have the right legal partners by your side. So I think with this session, you've given them a broad overview, right from formalizing a business structure to a founder's agreement, to safeguarding the intellectual property, to enforcing business contracts. It is absolutely essential that entrepreneurs have this broad understanding. And uh, you know that's, that's how it will make their journeys much more easier. So thank you so much to both of you for this. And uh, a big thank you to the Ficky Flow team, to Vertis's partners, and to our um, college collaborators, Million Minds and IIT Bombay. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here.